So with that, I would now like to call Ahmed Saleh Al Balushi, Managing Director of FinTech ICT Services and Consultations to open this panel discussion on predictive analytics and artificial intelligence. Over to you, Ahmed Saleh Al Balushi, please. Thank you very much. I want to thank you very much. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri amri wa ahli al-amta min lisani yafahu qawli. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening in this event and one of our great show in BTX 2000, 2021 Roadshow. And of course, we are focusing on the artificial intelligence topics where uh, we have a group of international, international group of artificial intelligence. And our main focus is to distribute and show the world that how artificial intelligence is moving and advancing so fast. And everybody needs to grab that opportunity and uh, go to that stage where he can improve the businesses and all, all, the, all the aspects that he needs for a better business. Uh, before I start the panel, I would like to call uh, on the panel, Dr. Jassim Haji, the president of International Group of Artificial Intelligence uh, to address his speech. Thank you, please. Go ahead, Dr. Jassim. Thank you very much, uh, my friend Ahmed. Uh, Thank you all for joining. Uh, good evening. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, I'd just like first to uh, uh, thank the organizers for giving us this window uh, for the team who you would see and hope you will enjoy and benefit from their discussions on the artificial intelligence. And this is something that we will try to do in every roadshow that we, you know, the, the team takes over, uh, including. Uh, Africa, Asia, and elsewhere. Uh, uh, just in, in a few seconds, International Group of Artificial Intelligence, I would call it the fastest growing uh, group in the whole world in terms of artificial intelligence, because it's growing every corner of the world. Of course, there are bigger organizations, probably in Europe and North America, but, but what distinguishes this is that we have already uh, countries in the Middle East, in Asia, Africa, Europe, and Caribbean, North America, with representatives, and we keep growing with members and representatives, and all towards the knowledge of the artificial intelligence. And should you uh, be interested, the professionals, the academies, uh, the executives, uh, to be part of uh, this uh, intellectual group, uh, the team, I believe, uh, uh, of BTX show will be happy to help you. Without further ado, back to you, Ahmed. Thank you all. Enjoy the, the show. Thank you very much, Dr. Jossim. And now I would like to start, because we don't have too much time, so I'll start the panel with our uh, guests and speakers. And I will start uh, to introduce them before we start with the questions. First, we have Sheikh Khalid bin Hamad Al Khalifa with 20 years in healthcare IT. Sheikh Khalid is currently the project director at the Bahrain Supreme Council of Health Working Leading Healthcare Transformation Team for the Universal Healthcare Coverage in Bahrain. Working at the Royal Medical Services and King Hamad University Hospital as a CIO, he used to work over there. Um, he holds a master in software engineering from George Washington University and MBA from the University of Strathclyde. His research interests are around data science, analytics, and artificial intelligence. Our second, second speaker is Dr. Emmanuel Dufi. Dr. Emmanuel is a philosopher of AI. He is the co-director and co-founder of the Global AI Ethics Institute in Paris. He holds a PhD in political science from the Paris Institute of Political Studies. Dr. Goffey is also advisor in AI ethics with Huawei, as well as faculty member with the Big Data Lab at the Goethe University in Frankfurt, Germany, and research fellow with the Center for Defense and Security Studies at the University of Manitoba. Our last speaker is Dr. Ilham Suleimani. Zremani, she is currently a professor at the Department of Computer Science at Mohammed I University Faculty of Science, Ogda, Morocco. Her research and publication areas include machine learning, supply chain management, and demand forecasting 
transport, transportation and road traffic uh, forecasting, um, she's attached to the computer networks, IoT and finance. She is engineer graduated from National School of Applied Science, OJA, a PhD from the National School of Computer Science and System Analyst in Rabat. Um, I would like to welcome all our, our speakers to the panel. And I just want to tell the audience that our, our speech will be focusing on artificial intelligence and predict, prediction analysis, but we will be talking on some other things. Our focus is on the healthcare, the ethics, and the education, and some extra things as per the time that we have. I will start where we have ended the introduction of the speaker, which is Dr. Elham. With digitalization as a trend, how does information technology in general and AI in particular affect a company's performance today? Mike is yours, Dr. Elham. Thank you. Thank you, dear Ahmed. Thank you for having us today. Thank you for giving us the opportunity of being part of the change uh, without any delay. So uh, the, the, I will try to answer this first question. So the term digital transformation is now a buzzword, artificial intelligence also. So uh, from, from, uh, from our, in, in our daily life, uh, artificial intelligence and digital transformation are emerging our life in a, in so many uh, different uh, ways, from smartphones to ebooks to robotic robotics to websites, etc. So um, it is important to note that uh, when we talk about digital uh, transformation, the the uh, starting point is also is always uh, gonna be data. Data is uh, always uh, the starting point of each digitalization process data as uh, we've already we've uh, probably heard uh, is uh, the, the, the expression that data is the new oil and uh, it turns out that now data worth much more than oil in a, in a way that uh, that that they both generate value however uh, the the, day, the the value generated from data is uh, is not used up uh, in a way that it can be renewable, it can be reusable, and uh, we can we can extract so much knowledge and value uh, from from uh, data. Uh, besides, uh, as as uh, as you you uh, you asked, uh, how how did uh, how can artificial intelligence affect uh, companies? Uh, companies' performance today, uh, artificial intelligence can 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 uh, serve many purposes in a company, such as reasoning, problem solving, perception, learning, uh, estimating, or forecasting. Uh, even when uh, we're uh, we're talking about analytical thinking, optimization, or planning, it's all we, we can all do that uh, based on artificial intelligence techniques. So. Uh, as, as a, a last word, artificial intelligence and machine learning are definitely affecting our, our life and the uh, and IT careers in general. Uh, so uh, I, th I think that that's it. Thank you for, uh, for your question, for the first question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Elham. Yes, I do agree okay. with you 100%. Data, they are the oil of artificial intelligence. Without data, we cannot take the artificial intelligence to the next uh, level yeah. of, of, of innovation. Thank you very much, Dr. Elham. Now, Dr. Dr. Goofy, why is, I mean, we, would, we are talking, Dr. Goofy, from the uh, prediction ana analysis or analytics perspective. And I know that you are expert in, on the ethics side. Why is there such a strong focus on ethics applied to AI nowadays. And I know this is very important because the things that are going on uh, with AI, it makes lots of people, they, 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 they have the big fear about AI. So why is there such a strong focus on ethics applied to AI nowadays? Mike is yours, Dr. Goofy. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, really interesting question, actually. Um, uh, what we've seen so far is that ethics um, has grown into the public debate regarding artificial intelligence. Uh, the main reason is obviously that, like any kind of technology, when you have this kind of new tools that is appearing on the market, it goes with a lot of concerns. So a lot of people are concerned about what we can do and what, uh, uh, what can be the use and the bad use, I would say, of artificial intelligence. So there is this growing concern about artificial intelligence, but I would, I would just 
also mention something that we uh, uh, we don't hear that much about, which is the Western perspective that is behind this fear that we have toward artificial intelligence, and that is not shared by all the culture and all the countries all around the world. Uh, basically, I would say that uh, if you look at the Western philosophy, we do believe that this is this is starting with Aristotle and Plato. We do believe that human beings at, at the top of the hierarchy of, of nature, right? And, and given this position at the top of the, of, of the pyramid, we feel like we have to be in control of the rest of the world, of the rest of the environment we live in, right? So AI is seen as any kind of technology, as a tool that will allow us to control the rest of the world, right? So in this kind of world, obviously, if you are the US, you are first, you, have the, you are the leader in artificial intelligence, so you can impose your perspective, your view to the rest of the world. If you're European, you cannot compete with such great actors. So you have to find something else. And what we found actually is a niche, something that other actors do not have, which is namely norms. So you know that if you want norms, you have either ethical norms or legal norms. But legal norms are really, really difficult to set, and especially for this fast-paced technology. If you set, let's say, legal norms today, they won't be efficient within five years because things are really going fast. So instead of working on something that would be really constraining and that would not work uh, on the long term, we have focused on ethics, which is what we call soft law. It's not really constraining. It gives the sense that we have norms, that we have a frame, which is not really true. And at the same time, it gives the European Union and the European countries a kind of a a uh, specific role and, and a specific place into this really harsh competition. So uh, this ethical debate that we have today is mainly the product of the West trying to impose its own solution to its own problem to the rest of the world without taking into account the diversity of the perspective uh, in ethics and in philosophy or whatever uh, yeah, you're talking about in terms of norms. So the future, when you talk about perspective and that, uh, is, is really concerning because to my opinion, there is kind of an hegemony of the West uh, in the normative framework about artificial intelligence. And what I'm seeing today is that a big big um, uh, actors such as in the Middle East or in Asia or even Latin America are growing. And at some point, they will no longer accept this kind of hegemony of the West. And they will say, we don't have to follow your rules because we do not share the perspective, right? We have our own rules that are embedded in our own values. And this is what we want to put forward. We don't want to accept this hegemony from the, from the West. So my feeling and my fear is that um, uh, instead of regulating with a global governance, we are moving toward much more tensions and issues and we will deregulate artificial intelligence instead of having this kind of global governance. Thank you very much, Dr. Emmanuel. Yeah, I, I do actually agree with you on this part. And I know that because the world is moving toward this road of, of innovation, so they have to accept it. And the regulation should be set. You know, the, the rules, the policies, the regulations. You see, there are things more, more deeper than artificial intelligence. We are talking about the fourth industrial revolution, such as quantum computing. We're talking about the next generation of AI, which is the AGI, the AI uh, artificial global intelligence, or even the super artificial intelligence. So things need to move to faster A. Yeah, I know ethics are very important. Setting the policies and procedures are, are very, very important. Thank you very much, Dr. Emmanuel. It was really, uh, uh, you enriched this one with, with, with your answer. Sheikh Khaled, I know that you are in the healthcare area and you have like more than 20 years experience in this area. And I know that you are a person who loves AI and passionate about it. And again, from the same perspective of the predictive analysis, AI predictive analysis can impact various industries. How do you see it impacting healthcare? And what are some prominent applications that can help to improve the healthcare, the healthcare center? Mike is yours, uh, Sheikh. Uh, thank you, Ahmed. I just want to build on the point by Dr. Gofi. I think. Uh, 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 ethical issues, if we kind of uh, hold ourselves back, we are actually in healthcare holding back the ability to save lives and to improve the quality of care. And I think this is uh, very important uh, in terms of highlighting the importance of artificial intelligence in, ge in general 
uh, in healthcare itself. Uh, but to go to predictive analysis, I think it is one of the unique uh, areas in artificial intelligence because it really impacts every aspect of the healthcare spectrum, whether it is we are speaking about the financial uh, you know, cycle or about the operations, or even if we go to the uh, clinical, uh, clinical journey of the patient, uh, whether we talk about uh, the diagnosis of the patient, for, for example, if we diagnose for tumors, et cetera, uh, going to prognosis and predicting whether there is a possibility of a patient uh, having, for example, let's say, a heart failure in the future. So this is another area that follows uh, in terms of the health journey of a patient. Uh, treatment, uh, similarly, even in treatment, we can have uh, different examples of uh, areas where predictive analysis can, uh, let's say, provide the best uh, uh, treatment for the patient based specifically or especially if we include the uh, genetics information, if we bring in the genomics, uh, into the equation, we are moving into a new paradigm uh, of uh, personalized health and providing personalized treatment, uh, which will definitely uh, expand the horizon for healthcare, uh, let alone uh, talking about uh, shifting costs, because as we, are, as we know that uh, in healthcare, uh, the treatment costs are very high and moving that cost or shifting that cost into preventive activities will reduce the, uh, the amount being spent uh, on healthcare in general. Uh, one more thing about predictive anal uh, analysis that is unique is that it doesn't only rely on uh, historic data, uh, but it also builds on, on, on the projection and utilizes that data and then it can by itself uh, through, those, through algorithms uh, provide uh, predictive tools that uh, do not just rely on that historic data, but build on other variables, other factors. And this is unique when it comes to uh, being able to find different examples, different settings, different uh, applications uh, in healthcare. Over can, you give, can, you, can you give an example on this one specifically? Because it's a very interesting one. Because yeah, of course. The genomic of course. part of it. We have these cases of, 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 uh, of the coronavirus. Can you give an example in one minute? I mean, how, yeah, did, of course. Help, how, did, how did this help the countries and the people to, to get the cure, for example, or at least to take them the, 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 the measurements or, 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 or to go towards that road, which shows the people that I did help in this case. Can you just give yeah. me in one minute? Yeah, of course. I think uh, not specifically only on, on the COVID uh, situation, which we are uh, at. Uh, I mean, uh, the uh, predictive analysis is, is, is useful in, in uh, uh, measuring infection rates, whether it is uh, uh, in-hospital in infection rates, or even being able to predict uh, the spread of uh, the, uh, the virus, for example, during corona. I mean, the, fir the, the first days, uh, a lot of predictive tools were used to be able to measure how much uh, or how fast the virus is spreading, uh, being able to predict uh, um, cases. And, uh, and we have seen a lot of products now that can be used uh, in, in public uh, to be able to identify people who are uh, probable cases or very highly that they have uh, infection rates. So applications of predictive analysis have been uh, pushed to the limits and the products have been out uh, within months of, of, of the pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sheikh Khaled. Yes, I believe in this. Healthcare is very important, same, same as, as education. Uh, Dr. Elham, uh, coming back to you, and again, because I didn't ask you the question of the predictive analysis on the first question, it was about, uh, in general, particular effect of the companies for the performance from the AI perspective. Now, from the pre predictive analytics, this is very important. And I want you to give me an ex uh, a use case from the Morocco itself, okay? Uh, the predictive analytics is very important for decision making, and this is uh, this is I can see it as a businessman. I can see how important is it for us to move or to get a, a more precise results out of the the machine itself. It tells me to go left or right. Now, how predictive analytics? will help the firm strategy or to plan or to build a roadmap to take a decision using the AI? 
Thank you, thank you, uh, dear Ahmed, for the question. Interesting question. Actually, uh, I will, I will, uh, I will try to define as as already defined by Dr. Khalid, uh, predictive analysis or AI based predictive analysis is all about uh, using uh, statistical and mathematical tools in order to uh, to um, to forecast the future. Uh, making these uh, forecasts uh, is just assuming that the past is is um, is good reflection of the future, which is not uh, always true. Uh, I would like to, to quote an example that I read uh, before. It's like when we're talking about uh, predictive analysis, it's like uh, driving a car forward on a highway by looking just into the rear uh, view mirror, and uh, if so we suppose that if the road ahead, uh, the road ahead is exactly the same as uh, you've already covered in the past. So uh, th there's no issues; you're safe. But if not, it's not. So uh, if it's not the same, so uh, I think everyone can guess the the the, uh, the results or the outcome of this of this system. So AI predictive analysis uh, can be can be uh, used in so many ways in business uh, context, uh, using of course machine learning and deep learning tools. Uh, so uh, the the the, um, the uh, company, the CEO companies can can uh, can learn from the, their past mistakes and can and avoid making the same mistakes in the future. So uh, you asked me uh, about. I would like. I would like to to uh, project the the, the, the this uh, issue on a Moroccan uh, case. So uh, working from, from my personal experience, and uh, I had the chance to work uh, with other uh, research team uh, here in Morocco. Uh, we had the chance to use. AI-based predictive analysis for marketing purposes, for for instance, uh, we uh, we have the chance to uh, we we uh, we had uh, access to a data set from provided for uh, from a recognized supermarket here in Morocco, and uh, based on this hair circle data, we we had we uh, we had to uh, forecast future demand. And as a marketer, you we 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 all know that if we want to launch a new marketing campaign, mar marketing campaign, we we have have to use uh, historical data. The study uh, we uh, we we um, we compared the performance, the, the forecasting performance of uh, different models, uh, including uh, deep learning, uh, including uh, neural networks, etc. So for for the technical. Uh, way so the results clearly uh, indicate that uh, making prediction based on uh, artificial intelligence artificial intelligence pardon me in general and uh, deep learning in particular uh, gives uh, better much better results when we were using uh, statistical models for instance so uh, all in all, uh, I should say that we we have to we have to as as a, as a, uh, business as a, in a context business we have to adopt an AI based predictive analysis and it's best uh, is is the best way to ensure uh, your your uh, your uh, ensure being being uh, being uh, actually your profits rather than surviving in this competitive world. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Back to you. Very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Elham. Yes, I do agree with you. AI. <laughs> when I say predictive, then I just say that AI. I cannot say anything but AI. Uh, Dr. Emmanuel. Now, again, going back to the ethics. Ethics is something very important in this world. <laughs> Not for AI only, but anything else. Can we consider that current ethical perspectives regarding AI are universal? Or should we consider ethics applied to AI through cultural lenses? Mike is yours. Yeah, thank you for the question. Really interesting question, actually. And um, the only fact that you're mentioning the importance of ethics is something that is uh, kind of weird to me because I feel like uh, uh, if you go around the world, you will see that in some places, actually, ethics is kind of a non-question. Uh, ethics is a very uh, Western, once again, concept is a very Western way of assessing what is acceptable and what is not. Uh, working with China, for example, I can tell you that ethics is not a problem for them. That's that's not the way they think the world. Doesn't mean that they are not ethical. That's not that's not the point. My point is that the question that we are 
having here in the West uh, are not the same as the one that you can find, for example, in First Nation in, in, in Northern Canada or in Aboriginal uh, communities in, in, in Australia, etc. So it's not something that is universally uh, shared. I mean, first, first thing. Uh, second is that uh, there is no universal value at all, and there is no proof of that. Lots of people are actually asserting that there are universal values so far, and, and, and my knowledge is pretty limited. I, I know that uh, I haven't been proved that there is such value that is shared universally. And when I say when I say universal, I mean universal by everybody all around the world by all time right uh, and i feel like uh, just just look around you uh, just look at the countries that are near you and you will see that you do not share values with some of them right so meaning that they are not universal at all and even when uh, you can find some values that are basically shared by some community what you will find is that the meaning of the value let's say friendship for example is not the same from one country to another I'm French and Canadian. When I've lived in Canada, actually, friendship does not have the same meaning as it has, for example, in France. Uh, they, we're using the same word, but the practice is not the same at all, right? So meaning that even if you're using the same value, the same word, you don't have the same meaning behind that. And then even when you have the same meaning and the same words, you won't have the same hierarchy. Let's say for me, my, maybe friendship will come first, but maybe for someone else, money will come first, right? So this, all these put together shows that actually there is no such things as universal value. Interestingly, interestingly, when you look at sociology, um, uh, this speech about universal values is called one, a speech act, meaning that we are creating something just by saying it. And, and we all take it for granted that there are universal values, but there is no such thing. If you travel around the world, you will see that lots of people do not share the same values as you, right? Uh, it, it's obvious to, to look at dictatorship and, and this kind of country. I do not share values with people that are, are living under this kind of, of perspective, right? My perspective, personal perspective. Uh, so it's something that is really, and it's related to what I was saying earlier about the Western hegemony. It's something that we have created. We just have to step back, see the big picture. It's all about international relations and the way we see the world that has been imposed by the United States and then by the West at the large, saying we have universal values because we live in a cosmopolitan world. And this is something that even in France, we do not all share, right? Uh, cosmopolitanism is not something that is really accepted. Uh, I would say that my priority come to my community first. I do not feel like I'm a cosmopolitan, right? Family and, and you know, maybe your village, your city, your religious community, this kind of things. And then maybe at, at the very end, you will think about the rest of the world, right? So this is really, once again, a Western view uh, on, on that. So uh, uh, we, we really have to, um, to get rid of this perspective. We really have to free ourselves. And, and what I'm calling for definitely is for, um, you know, national or domestic perspective on, on, on that. Just because I'm, I'm hearing the same speech, the same words, the same uh, ideas time and again, which are actually summaries of summaries based on other summaries. What do you, recommend? What do you recommend? From your perspective, what, what do you recommend? The best yeah, approach? What, what I do recommend is actually that each country, because we cannot split the world into culture, that, that's too complicated, but each country should set its own ethical perspective when relevant. If you don't have any kind of question regarding ethics, that's not a problem, but you don't have to accept that other will tell you what you have to do in your country, right? So the important thing here is that your country, your public authorities should work on establishing their own set of ethical rules or legal rules when relevant. And you must not wait for the West to provide you with such rules, which is happening in Africa. And I've, I've heard a lot about Africa must be included. No, Africa must set its own perspective. They must not be included in the Western perspective. That's a bias. And we're all talking about biases that are unacceptable. This is the first bias that we have to get rid of. I agree. A hundred percent. I just wanted to see from your experience, from the ethical point of view, I wanted to see how is it. I, I do agree with you hundred percent. Nobody should wait for anyone. You have to set your own policies and procedures. If you want to move forward, then you don't wait for anyone. This is your own life. This is your own house. Go, go there, set your team and set your policies and procedures. Then you go on. Otherwise, if, 
if I have to wait for Google or Apple to provide me a service or a, or a device, then what is, what, is my, what is my being in this, in this life? If I have the mind, and I can do it myself. So why I don't do it? Thank you very much, Dr. Emmanuel. Great point. I, I, really, I really appreciate your answers. Uh, going back to Sheikh Khaled, again to the healthcare, the, the, the important place, the place that the people always, you have to go there, especially these days. <laughs> Hopefully not. Yeah, what are the technical? Again, I'm talking about the ethical as well, but, but I know that you will you will uh, you will talk about it in more details. Although it is it is Dr. Emmanuel uh, 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 expertise, but I know from the healthcare perspective, I need to know the technical and ethical challenges that may face the healthcare applications whenever you are using AI predictive analysis. Yeah, I think uh, uh, Dr. Goffi makes a good point. It's how you ad uh, address these ethical challenges and. Uh, as we are aware, it's, uh, there, is a, there are many ethical uh, uh, issues or let's say challenges that are uh, inherent uh, with healthcare, specifically, let's say around the, the patient autonomy uh, in terms of uh, how the patient can make his own decision. And uh, this is where uh, using uh, predict, uh, predictive analysis and analysis, analytic tools uh, can, can come into play and, uh, you know, uh, this is where we, we need to define where we are in the spectrum of uh, ethics uh, and how much we will allow um, uh, predictive analysis tools uh, to make those decisions on behalf of patients, specifically some patients who are not able to make their own decision given their condition. So this is one of the you know, areas that are, uh, you know, let's say, uh, that come with healthcare. Uh, again, the confidentiality and data security uh, is, is something that is very important to talk about because uh, you are aware uh, of uh, how much that is uh, hot in terms of the ability to uh, misuse that information. And uh, in healthcare, this is another area that uh, we kind of cross and need to be able to address how we want to approach this, uh, this area of uh, data privacy or patient privacy. Uh, and this comes along with patient safety and uh, uh, let's say the patient outcomes, because uh, when, when, we, when we look at those uh, artificial intelligence solutions in healthcare, uh, some of them are actually, uh, uh, let's say, affected by the, uh, the cultural bias or let's say the data bias that, that, that comes or is inherent with those algorithms. And therefore, uh, we need to make sure that this is something that is uh, addressed when, uh, when adopting uh, AI uh, are predictive analysis specifically because uh, there we can really have uh, an impact on the patient safety and outcomes uh, due to a, 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 a let's say a, a non-rigorous or uh, or a direct applying uh, or application of a, 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 a AI solution that has been only tested in different uh, cultures but not adapted to uh, let's say the local culture itself. Uh, again, uh, other challenges that are general, uh, let's say, uh, not only maybe uh, to healthcare is the availability of uh, people or let's say uh, um, uh, enough, enough uh, resources that are able to take forward those solutions. And this is something that uh, we kind of face when we are uh, trying to implement some of our solutions is that we are really trying to move or uh, uh, move into new areas or frontiers in, in healthcare. And this needs, needs expertise that sometimes is very challenging uh, to find. And this will allow us also to be able to incorporate uh, those solutions in a, in, in, a, in a good manner and in a good, uh, in a, in a good fashion in, uh, across the, 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 the healthcare provision uh, or the decision-making process, because as you are aware, uh, sometimes those decisions need to be taken on the spot during a, an outpatient visit uh, to a doctor. And we need to be able to provide that timeliness and as well as uh, maintaining all the other ethical issues that uh, I've mentioned earlier. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sheikh Khaled. Yes, 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 yes. I do believe in this. I think we have, uh, we have, uh, uh, technologies that can help in such uh, putting data in more confidential area. Check your, your WhatsApp. I send, I send you a message. Maybe if, if we can't permit, and I can ask you that question. Um, but now let's go move on to, to, 
Uh, let's go to Dr. Elham. Okay. We said that we agree that AI is the future. Yes, we do agree. We don't have an option. Yeah. It's like I remember. I remember when I was talking because I'm I'm an expert on on, on the blockchain technologies, and I remember that I some of the banks or financial institutes. I asked, I told them that blockchain is the future of the financial technologies. They said, no, it will not be. Uh, everything will be centralized. I said, for now, yes. But you will be forced to go there because this is the future as of the industry 4.0 is forcing you to move there. Now, with AI, it's the future because the trend of the world is forcing you to move to that trend. It's not up to you. It's, it's, it, it is... It is an enforcement for you to, to move from one place to another place. Same with what happened in the pandemic. Nobody wanted to work from distance. But see, we work from distance. We had to work from distance. Other things will come and force you to use this. So is AI capitalized after all? Dr. Elham? Thank you. Thank you. Focus, Thank you. I, uh, I, uh, because we didn't talk about the education. huh? If you can talk about and focus on education, it will be much appreciated. This is another element, another aspect as important as the healthcare, healthcare is. Okay, okay, uh, dear Ahmed, thank you for the, the question. Um, I definitely agree with you concerning uh, blockchain as the future of AI in finance. I completely agree on that point. Uh, as you, you already said, so we all agree that AI is the future of everything. And uh, AI is the, buzz, the buzzword. Uh, so, simple answer to this question is yes, AI is capitalized in, by so many companies. I don't know if I'm supposed to name some companies. So, uh, in, in social media, in uh, daily our daily life, so many companies uh, have capitalized on AI. Uh, so, uh, we to adopt an AI uh, approach or an AI uh, perspective is, is no longer an option. It becomes a, a, necessi a necessary thing to do. So I would say that uh, if, if you want to uh, talk more about about Morocco, uh, yes, we have to, we we had uh, the last decades. Morocco uh, is largely investing in AI now. Uh, so uh, in order to capitalize on this demand for AI in research and development. Uh, for research and development in general. So uh, if we want to focus on education, how, to, how AI can be capitalized on education, as you already said, dear Ahmed, so uh, this pandemic uh, made it very clear that education cannot wait for someone. We have to, to learn uh, using uh, AI. And uh, in Morocco, we still have to work on that. So uh, I think uh, as a contribution, we should we should uh, think about uh, chatbots that can replace the um, education, traditional education. So chatbot is an intelligence robot that can replace a teacher in a virtual world. And we can have many benefits from it since students uh, who attend the same class have uh, in, in general, they have uh, different skills, different interests, uh, so uh, different abilities in general. So a chatbot can, can be, uh, can you can, can help uh, a student uh, and uh, improve his uh, communication skills, his techno technical skills or collaboration skills in so many ways. Uh, still talking about uh, the, the AI ex uh, experience in Morocco, we have uh, a platform called Masar here in Morocco, and this platform is dedicated to uh, data related to education in general. So uh, this, uh, uh, for now, this platform is just about uh, about a crude, it's a crude platform, so about uh, adding, updating, deleting data, etc. So we have to, to add uh, other uh, BI, business intelligence uh, mod modules, business intelligence plugins, so it can be more intelligent and it can, it can, uh, we can, we can uh, detect learning, for instance, learning differences and improve targeting uh, of courses and supports services uh, with with Masar platform data. We can we can correlate this platform with other data sources. For
from uh, urban, from satellites, etc. AI can tell us uh, which school needs which resource uh, in terms of educators, administrators, supplies, etc. And we can learn uh, from from uh, we, we can we can uh, we can uh, we can we can learn so many things by uh, by uh, implementing AI in our education system in general. So uh, as, as a closing word, so uh, AI is just a tool that we're supposed to use properly in order to benefit from, and every, everything has a risk. So uh, we won't be able to grow unless we, we, we take a risk, a risk actually. Thank, thank you, Ahmed, back to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Elham, thank you very much. Yes, education is something that I'm really concerned about when it comes to AI. And, and I believe that uh, as, as, as important as the healthcare is, education is very important. And we need to work so hard as AI experts to spread the idea and, uh, and, uh, and the concept that we need to move to that stage. And education is not less than healthcare. You have good people, uh, 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 people who has knowledge and, and they know how to think and they know how they can see the future, those people who can build. The, the country and the world for you. Thank you very much, Dr. Elham. Uh, coming back to you, Dr. Um, Gofi. Uh, it's again the same thing, actually. I, I will go back to that, but I needed to, I needed to elaborate on it a bit more because this is very important. At the end of the day, we are living in a world and this world need to participate. I, need, I mean, I can, I can govern the things within my country. I can put the rules and policies and procedures within my country. But still, when I want to travel abroad or I want to deal with countries, then I need these people to, to, to give me something to work on it, to, 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 to follow it. So how can AI be framed at the international level? So is it possible to reach some kind of global governance for AI? Mike is your doctor. A yeah, really interesting question, Ahmed. Definitely, uh, I, I would say that yes, global governance is something that is reachable and that is necessary. As you were saying, we are not uh, living isolated in our countries, so we are we are dealing with each other, and we have we have to find uh, room for compromises. Uh, I'm I'm just concerned about the fact that uh, we are not moving uh, in the right way. Uh, we we really first thing I, I think that we first have to um, drop this what I call cosmetics, which is the narrative about ethics. We are using words of ethics without doing ethics. That's the first thing that we have to get rid of. Then we have to start listening to others. We have to accept cultural diversity. And here, it, it's not just me saying that. It's something that you will find in the Universal Declaration of, uh, of Diversity by the UNESCO in, tw in, in 2001, something that is also enshrined in the new charter, right? The, the, the respect of cultural diversity is something really important. The OECD is also calling for cultural diversity. Lots of international organizations and lots of, uh, of fora are, are calling for this uh, respect for cultural diversity, which is, according to the UNESCO, related to human dignity. And, and even the UNESCO is considering this, uh, uh, this defense of cultural diversity as an ethical imperative. So there is room for, 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 a, for a discussion in global governance, but there is one condition for that. And this condition is discussion, debate. And we have, and when I say because I'm, I'm in the West, I'm in the West, uh, we really have to learn how to listen to others. We don't have to agree on, on what we're doing, what we're saying on our values, but we have to accept that others will have different perspective. The same way we have to expect others to respect the fact that we have different perspectives. So the only way to reach a global governance uh, would be to have a discussion uh, between all stakeholders. And the idea for me is to have kind of on the same, um, on the same model as uh, for, for, let's say, economy and financial institution, maybe we should have kind of clusters of country that do share values that do have common interest in the field of AI. So they can just um, uh, work together, create their own set, let's say like the European Union is working on its own uh, rules. And then one, you have two clusters with different perspectives, different values, different interests that have to, uh, let's say, discuss together or work together. Then we need kind of a neutral third party that will help us to meet in the middle of the bridge, not 
the way we're doing the thing today, which is we're expecting others to meet us on our side of the bridge. That doesn't work, right? We really have to be respectful of the diversity. Cultural diversity is really something that is important. It's the beauty of humanity. So we really have to, uh, to, to work on that. So yes, global governance is possible. Universal governance is not, but global governance is totally possible. We just have to get rid of this idea of universality, of values and this kind of things. We have to stop looking for kind of a universal code of ethics, which does not make sense and which would definitely lead us to what kind of a tyranny of the West. And this is something that we do not want. But I think that we have to go back to multilateral discussions and we have to create those clusters of countries, cultures that do share uh, values and interests that will work together. And then once again, when we have to discuss with each other, then we will need some kind of neutral uh, third party. So yes, it, it's possible. And I think that's the, it's not the perfect way. There is no perfect way uh, dealing with artificial intelligence, but that, I think it's the best way. And it's way better than what we're doing now, which is trying to impose one unique perspective to the rest of the world. Thank you very much, Victor. Yes. 100% you are right. And with the current technologies that we have and with the current utilities and features that we have, this can be done, can be done really. And with, with, with the efforts of you, the academics and, and the experts, these things can be done, inshallah. I have one more question for Sheikh Khaled. Then I will ask one common question for everyone before we close down. Uh, Sheikh Khaled, uh, you remember just a few, few minutes ago, I talked about blockchain, yeah? And I know maybe maybe some of you they do not have the deep knowledge about it, but I know that blockchain is all not only by the way for financial transactions, it's not only for for banks. Uh, blockchain is a system that will give you the options to make to 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 encrypt your transaction. Yeah, and it's a very highly encrypted. We are talking about encryption of SHA two five six expansionally. Expansionally 256. So you cannot even imagine, nobody can break it. And it's a transactional database, uh, distrib decentralized everywhere. You can centralize it, but it's decentralized means that my computer can be part of this blockchain where I can, your transaction can go through it, another computer, another country. So it is very, very difficult to trace it. It's very difficult to hack it. And uh, it's only the only thing is that the countries are not with it because it's not as decentralized. Uh, Doctor uh, Sheikh Khaled. Now, and from the healthcare perspective, and you talked about the confidentiality of the the records, the the patient records, and the people they do not want them to see their records. How do you think blockchain can help in healthcare using AI? I mean, using the AI. As, as a tool and blockchain as a technology as well, how this can help the healthcare center, the healthcare sector. Uh, thank you, Ahmed. I think yeah, we're probably not uh, too deep into blockchain, but definitely, uh, I, I mean, there are there are many applications that can be, let's say, uh, adopted uh, using uh, um, blockchain technology. But uh, usually, I mean. For, uh, myself, if uh, approached by a certain technology, I will I'll probably do an assessment about uh, why I would use this approach as compared to any other approach. So uh, in, 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 in a case of, for example, uh, a health information exchange portal, uh, would I use a blockchain technology? Uh, again, it all depends on our business needs and how we define our ethical issues as uh, maybe uh, Dr. Goffey expanded on, I think this, this will allow us to be able to select the best technology for us. And if it's blockchain, then definitely, I think uh, it has its merits. We know that uh, it, it is uh, quite extensive in the, in, in, in the financial industry, but again, in the healthcare industry, the, it's, it's also extensively used. I'm not saying extensively, but it's widely used in different applications, uh, such, as, such as the supply chain uh, of, of drugs, uh, for health information exchange. So there are applications, but um, personally, usually I, I would always assess my needs and then I would select that technology if it's the most appropriate one for me. Thank you very much, Khaled. I have, before I close, I have one common question. I'll start with Dr. Elha. If the common question is, is, is more into motivational or inspirational for others. Now, we are in mid of 2021. We are moving towards the next 
period of 2021 and going to 2022. And I can see, if I'm talking about what I'm reading and what I'm facing and experiencing, I can see the world is moving so fast. And everybody is trying to catch up from this cake, the big cake of the economy, the, the money. But on the other hand, there is a message. There is, there is something that we, as the expert of, of, of the industry 4.0, including AI, machine learning, big data, internet of things, blog things, we have this message. We need to deliver it to the others. Now, if you were in your country, Dr. Elham, and you would love to send a message to your uh, decision makers that this is the future and I want you to adopt it. What would you say? How it will enhance and change the shape of your country? Great, great question, uh, Dear Ahmed, as a, as a closing word. So uh, AI is the future. AI is, we are living the future, actually. AI is everywhere. And data, when we're talking about AI, we can't talk, we cannot talk about AI without talking about data. And we're now facing big data now, where we're at the emerging of, uh, of data. We have data everywhere. Though. So the world is, is uh, constantly changing. And we're, we're, uh, we're, uh, we're, we are creating data every, every single day. So uh, as, as, a, as a last word to, uh, to uh, experts, uh, in Morocco and in general, so uh, in uh, uh, to to experts, to AI experts, to marketers, to to uh, to experts in general. So uh, AI is is a tool that we need to uh, to use properly. If we don't, would so the the outcome that we we are attending and we we, we want to have at, at, at last. So uh, we cannot achieve our goal if AI is not properly properly uh, used. So uh, we have we have to choosing choosing the right tool of AI is not a simple uh, task. Actually, we have to adopt AI on uh, your uh, your features on your uh, goals on your company. So we have we we have to to work on uh, so much different uh, things, including ethics, security, so and so on. So uh, AI is definitely the future, and we have to adopt AI in every single thing in, on, in our daily life, actually. Thank you very much, Dr. Elham. Yes, impressive, impressive closing. This is very impressive. Uh, Dr. Gofi, uh, the same question goes to you. It's yours. Yes. You, have a, you have a mic to talk to your officials, to your decision makers. Send them the message. Yeah, I would have lots of things to tell them. Definitely, Fatsim would say, uh, I would say just start thinking about AI as something that we can share uh, instead of creating new tensions. And, and first, mind your own business. Do not lecture others. Do not explain others what they have to do, what is acceptable and what is not. And, and start, uh, start working in a, in a clever way. I, I mean, just discussing with or sharing with others. Uh, you, you know, you were saying that AI is a huge, huge, huge uh, thing, and definitely we all have uh, some place in, in, into this this uh, race for for competition. We are all looking for money. That's okay, and this is also something that I would say to uh, to, to the French government to just uh, first uh, assume the fact that you are looking for money. Like any other actor, like any other stakeholders, you are trying to have your lion's share of that. Do not hide behind the veil of ethics and this kind of things, right? That would be something really beneficial for all of us. So I would say, start listening, stop minding the uh, business of others, and, and just assume the stance of the European Union and France, which is there is money to be made from AI. We want part of this money. And I think that working together we would be stronger because once again, one can work on the agricultural side, one can work in the health industry, other can work in the defense industry. So there is room. You don't have to compete. You don't have to fight against each other, right? Uh, you can race just side by side. And, and I feel like we will all get something from, from that. Thank you very much. Impressive. Yes, yes. I do agree with you 100%. Sheikh Khaled, mic is yours. Thank Send you. The message. Send my, the mes message. My, my message is simple. Where are you and the journey of uh, AI? I think this is uh, a journey that uh, everyone, every company, every country, every organization will take. Uh, the idea is that you have to identify where you are in that journey. You have, you have to know 
what's your strategy to approach uh, AI uh, and how you want to adopt it, uh, how you will be able to up upgrade the skills, how will you deal with, with the outcomes of, of adopting AI as we uh, read and about uh, job loss. And we know that, uh, you know, uh, th these are things that are expected, but we, these are our challenges that we, we can deal with if we properly know where we are exactly and how we are going to deal with AI. Thank you very much, Sheikh uh, Khaled. Yes, and I would love to say something as well about this. I'm a big believer in, in, in the future sciences, and I, I, I do I do focus even in, on my organization to, to work on the, not only AI, the Industry 4.0 technologies. And why, why I think about this a lot? Because I can see that we have a, a, a great generation that are coming on. You know, we call them the alpha generation who born in 2010. These kids, I mean, I have one of them. My, my son, the, the youngest kid, he is born in 2010. And I can see how he is passionate to the technologies. And, and not, not because I am a technologist, because, because he is living in it. He is living in the technology. And he is forced to use it. Now, if he has to use it and he wants to become an accountant, or an engineer or a decorator why he do not use technology with his uh, uh, specialties that he is studying why he cannot become an, a, a civil engineer who can draw buildings using 3d uh, technologies why he cannot why the doctor he cannot do the operations through machines through robots why why the ceos cannot go to his office and press a click where the AI can give them a predictive analytic reports where he can take a decision. This is my message to my place, to my countries, to the world, that this is the future. You have to go there. Otherwise, you will be sitting as I'm sitting here and you will see people passing you so fast and you'll just regret it at later stage that why I did not follow that. Thank you very much, everyone, Dr. Elham, Dr. Emmanuel, Sheikh Khaled, for being with us over here. It was a pleasure for me to be the moderator in this session. And I hope in the future I can you can join me in other shows. And BTX Roadshow is one of the greatest shows to, to, to spread the message that artificial intelligence and Industry 4.0 is the future of the human. Thank you very much. Aaron, the mic is back to you.